Uh, you see, I know I'm not a woman. One year I did the course, and there was there was a woman on the course from California, and they are a bit different in California, aren't they? Hey. <laughs> I'm not from California. Oh, no, who, who's from California? No, I'm kidding. I am. You are from Cali Southern California. California. Yeah, it is. You're from <laughs> Southern California. <laughs> <laughs> and at the end of the course, she said to me, wow, that was fantastic. That was just absolutely wonderful. She said, I'll tell you, that just one more, one thing could have made it even better if you'd been a woman doing this. And she thought that was a compliment. It's <laughs> amazing. She was serious. <laughs> it would have been wonderful if only I'd been a woman. Just do the same course. No. <laughs> so that's how I've, I've. That's how I got my gender sorted out. I realise. I know where I am. So I'm not that. <laughs> American invention. We don't have these here. It's called a knee pad. Fantastic. I got I got this in California. Mm. It's uh, it, it, it's it, it does what it says. It's a pad and you put it on your knee. It's good. But it's got a half back so you can write on it. We don't have that. It's wonderful. You look surprised. You should know about these things. <laughs> I, I just thought of something. Uh, I think um, Sebastian asked that nobody sit there because of the, it's probably blocking the camera. Uh, get a uh, lovely get Sebastian was me. picture of the back of your head. Yeah. That's a bit, bit better. Yeah, that'd be fine. Well, I, I'm, you know, that's what he said. I don't know. Uh, I haven't. There you, go. you want to try it? You know. Yoo-hoo! I can, I can see my red pullover. Hi there. Oh, you're red and pullover. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's just a little bit better. Yeah. 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 Is everybody here? They aren't, are they? I think they are. Yeah. Like yeah. Fourteen, yeah. Yeah. Fourteen? Yeah. Yeah. Fourteen. Is that all? Yeah. I thought it was nineteen. Fourteen. No, nineteen are downstairs. Oh, nineteen are downstairs. Oh, gosh. Oh, uh, one's left. The one was it feeling ill. Oh, right. No, right, okay. <coughs> right. Um, what I'm looking at is um, what I'm now going to go into uh, with you is Goethe and the dynamic unity of the plant. What I'm looking for is Goethe and the dynamic unity of nature. And we're going to look at how this comes out, how this finds expression, this dynamic unity, in the growth of the plant. This would bring us to an entirely new idea of the one and the many, which is one of the fundamental ideas that comes throughout uh, thinking. Uh, th 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 Right, right back from the ancient Greeks onwards and has caused a great deal of, of controversy, puzzlement and so on. Um, and in doing this, um, we, we want to come to see the idea. Remember what we talked about, seeing the idea. So this is a new organising idea we're trying to come to. And we do this by learning to think like a plant lives. That's a phrase from Craig Holdridge. That's very precise. That's what Goethe does. He tries to learn to think like a plant lives so that the movement of his thinking will become the same as the movement of the growth of the plant. And therefore he will discover 
the movement of the growth of the plant in the very movement of his thinking itself. It's all in the movement. And <clears throat> I'm only taking the philosophical cross-section of this, because I'm doing philosophy. I'll talk about what that means later, because when you come to do the Goethean way of seeing with Margaret, it will seem completely different from what I'm doing now, but there'll come a point when you'll realise how it comes together. Because with her, you will actually go into the Goethean way of doing things, actual practice of doing it, which I'm not doing. Um, it's not part of my job. Then I've got to do this anyway. So <clears throat> let's begin at the beginning. I've given you a few quotes, which I think should make it a bit easier. Uh, the first quotation, which comes right at the beginning of the metamorphosis of plants, <clears throat> he says, anyone who observes even a little the growth of plants will easily discover that certain of their external parts sometimes undergo a change and assume either entirely or in greater or lesser degree the form of the parts adjacent to them. It's not immediately clear what he means by this. And in fact, it's quite, we'll see later, it's quite easily open to misunderstanding what he's saying. So the first thing we need to do is understand what he means by external parts. And these are the organs growing up the stem of the plant. Oh, dear. Yes, I've got to put that down. I've given you that, but yes. Uh, and there's a, a picture there, uh, which... Uh, picture, yeah. Um, you've got the leaves wi winding up the stem, and then the ring of, that's a rather open one, as, um, it's, well it's been opened up so that it, the drawing can show the things. Hmm? There isn't that drawing. Or this one. Yeah, what, what, were, you, what were you thinking? Oh, I thought you were looking at another drawing. No. Uh, right. Yeah, okay. no. I mean, it, it's, uh, it's opened up. It's not quite as I wanted it. It's, my wife did this, and it wasn't quite what I wanted, but we discussed it, and we ended up with this. <laughs> uh, don't show this picture to Margaret. For heaven's sake, don't let her see this. I've gone mad. <laughs> the, the, the leaves wind up the stem. You all know what leaves look like. Then you get the flower at the top, and it's like the, the plant which winds up, then it all compresses into the flower, and all winds round within the flower, and you get rings of organs. The, first of all, there's the sepals. They're the outer, the outer bits that contain the bud before it opens. Then you get the ring of petals, and within that you have a ring of stamens, and then you've got the central organ, it's the extension of the stem, the pistil, and that, that's and in, in the box there at the bottom, it's the ovary. Um, I took that off the diagram because I said, I don't want to have a diagram pointing to anything you can't actually see directly, but oh, never mind. And the end of the stem where the reproduction takes place. That's all right. You all know about that anyway. So Goethe says that if you observe plants a bit, you'll notice at certain times that some of the parts undergo a change. And they take on the form, or partially the form, of the other parts adjacent to them. So he then brings out what he means more clearly by that in his next observation, which is under the diagram. So the simple flower, for example, often changes into a double one <coughs> if petals develop in the place of stamens and anthers. These petals may either perfectly resemble the other petals of the corolla. The corolla is simply the, 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 rings, the rings of flower organs, that's all. Both in form and colour, or they may still retain visible signs of their origin. That is, their petals, but they're in the place where normally you'd have stamens. The anthers are, stamens and anthers, the anthers are the bit on the ends of the stamens. So just stamens will do, okay? So where, the, where you would expect there to be stamens in the plant, you find to your surprise there aren't stamens, there are petals. There will be some stamens somewhere else, but where there would have been 
stamens, there are petals. Uh, petals in the wrong place, you could say. Uh, unexpectedly, oh, we've got a breakdown here, haven't we? We've got a breakdown in the normal process of growth. We know about breakdown, showing us what's there all the time, but we can't see. And sometimes these, uh, these extra petals, they, they appear just like, just like petals. Sometimes they appear a bit, a bit stamenish, like they're a bit half and half, can't make their mind up. <clears throat> now, an example is provided by the difference between the wild rose and the cultivated rose. You, you spotted that, good. If you have the wild rose, it's got terrifically open flower, one ring of petals, and ring upon ring upon ring upon ring of stamens. In the cultivated rose, most of those rings of stamens, where they are in the wild rose, are replaced by petals, rings and rings of petals, all closing in, therefore, and just a few stamens in the middle. So there you have a very good case. And <coughs> if you look at this kind of experience, you notice petals sometimes appear in the place of stamens, then you may, in fact, come to an intuition. You may have, begin to get a sense of that, that there is some connection between these organs, petals and, stables, petals and stamens. In some way, they are intrinsically related to one another, internally related. You may begin to get this kind of intuition growing in you. That there is some connection here. This is not actually given directly by the senses. What's given by the senses is what we've just described. Then from that you get, begin to get the intuition that there's some deeper connection here between these organs, <coughs> between petals and stamens. <coughs> um, <coughs> so there's organs which appear at first to be quite distinct and separate now appear distinct, but not in fact separate. They begin to seem to belong together in some way. We begin to get a sense of relationship or connection. We begin to experience what Goethe calls the secret affinity between petals and stamens. Mm -hmm. um, now the question would then arise, are there this is an abnormal growth, uh, because what happens is the plant grows in a normal sequence would go from leaves to sepals to petals to stamens. And so this one does that, and then it goes backwards a bit. It regresses a bit. So it's actually slightly abnormal. So the question then is, are there any cases in normal growth where we can see this secret affinity between petals and stamens in a more obvious way. And there are, and the case in question that I want to uh, bring up is the water lily, the white water lily. Uh, I'm not going to bother to put the other objective here because I can't be bothered. <coughs> but I've given you half the picture but not the other half, because I'd... Is there, no, don't worry, just, don't worry. No, 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 I can't be bothered. <coughs> Can you see it? Yeah. <laughs> it's there. But this is not a red water lily, a white water lily. This is the wrong water lily. This is a red water lily. Never mind. Uh, uh, you've got the rings of petals there. Can you see these rings standing up there? Can you see these stamens all standing up? Rings of them. Can you see that? Wait from where you are, if it's possible. Just again. Rings and rings of them standing up. But the fact is, when you look at them closely, they're odd. Uh, they're not actually proper stamens. They're intermediate between petals and stamens. And that's what you've got here in this picture. There. Put that there. There's your picture, which I 
carefully put on, underneath white water lily. And what you see there is what you get in successive rings. Starting on the left, you get a ring of petals. The next ring you get is the next one where it's slightly turned over. Then the next one it's more turned over, and so on and so on. But it doesn't just turn over, there's actually a refinement in the material as well. It's not, it's not a mechanical thing, just fold over a petal and you get a stamen. It's, it's more, more subtle than that. But that's how the form goes. And so what happens is, you can see several developments, development stages present simultaneously. So when you look at it, you look at the water lily, the overall effect when you look at it is that you seem to see one organ gradually turning into another one. You seem to see petals gradually turning into stamens. And you can look at this, and you could, if you see that there in front of your eyes, that's actually, it's, 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 it, again, it's the idea that enables you to see that. You, you get the connection. Um, so the thing becomes visible. But immediately, we are easily led into some difficulty. Um, because this is not what is happening. A petal does not form, turn into a stamen. Looks like it here, but it's not doing that. What's happening is something more subtle. No finished petal turns into a finished stamen. Petals do not turn into stamens. Now, when we talk about it and write about it, we often do so in just that way. And as we'll see, Goethe himself is guilty of that at the beginning here. And people have, since he talks about this as metamorphosis, change of form, then people think that what he's saying is that petals change into stamens. And since that's clearly wrong, they can say Goethe is wrong, he's totally superficial and so on. But they should look a little bit further. What actually happens is that we're, what we're seeing here is not a petal turning materially into a stamen, but one organ manifesting in different forms. <clears throat> so the metamorphosis is in the embryonic stage of plant growth and not the adult stage. And that, I think, is your next diagram. There we are. Uh, you can see the no, no, the no. It never goes, I mean, in fact, it could go either way in a plant. Well, we've seen that with the rose. Where there are petals, where, where there are stamens, they become extra petals. Normally, you would go, that would be the rose would go that way. Normally, you would go from the petal to the stamen that way. Uh, but actually, that doesn't happen. What happens is, it's the vegetative shoot, uh, the embryonic organ, which can take on the form of the petal, and then can take on the form of the stamen. And in these cases, the white water lily, the vegetative shoot is taking on those intermediate forms as well, which it wouldn't do otherwise. So that's the point of that diagram. That thing there is the embryonic thing, which clearly cannot be given the form, so I've dotted it. Because you cannot give that, does not have a form. These have a form. <laughs> okay, we'll get more into this later. So Goethe expresses this as follows. Have I put that down? No, there we are. Yes, referring to petals in the place of stamens. We're back to that. Goethe says, if we see that in this way it is possible for the plant to make a retrograde step and reverse the order of growth, we shall become all more aware of the normal course of nature and shall learn to understand those laws of transformation by which she produces one part out of another and creates the most varied forms by the modification of one single organ. Now you see the problem here. Because what he does 
is he says we got here uh, creates <coughs> she produces one part out of another which would make you think that nature produces a stamen out of a petal which is wrong then he goes on and says and creates the most varied forms by the modification of one single organ correct and that's that picture there the most varied forms by the modification of one single organ the embryonic organ so in that sentence there it's extremely interesting because he starts out by getting it wrong and then he gets it right in the same sentence but he obviously doesn't quite notice this uh, because he just goes from one to the other now I remember some years ago Anne from Norway via Malta when we went into this say, in a wonderful way she was Norwegian and she said do you think Goethe should have revisited what he wrote <laughs> <laughs> you know, the modern way people have of doing. Do you need to revisit your thoughts? Or that's what they say, isn't it? Don't you think you need to revisit what you've said? Or that's what you say, isn't it? It's that management speak, isn't it? When you really try to be very rude to someone, but making out you're being polite. Mm. You know what it is? <laughs> revisit. Goethe should have revisited what he wrote. <laughs> well, <laughs> this is a very good point because this enabled me to say this thing. It's very fascinating, is this? <clears throat> When a new idea emerges, it never emerges clearly. Emerges clearly. The clarity comes when it's emerged. It, when it emerges, I like to think, it never emerges cleanly. It emerges cluttered up. A new idea will emerge covered with material from the old idea, or another way of thinking. And gradually, that drops away, and the new idea then shines forth clearly. So you don't get new ideas springing to being just like that perfectly formed in the creative process. And this is a brilliant example of it here in Goethe's writing. <coughs> now... The next and final quote, or these quotes are the first four paragraphs of Goethe's Metamorphosis of Plants. They're simply numbered paragraphs. The secret affinity between the various parts of the plants, such as leaves, calyx, well I've put the word sepals in, that's what it means, corolla, that's petals and stamens, because those are his words, you see, calyx and corolla. And so we need leaves sepals, petals and stamens, which are developed one after the other, and as it were one out of the other, has long been recognized in a general way by naturalists. Indeed, much attention has been given to the study of it. The process by which one and the same organ, that's, this is the key sentence, da -da -da -dum. the process by which one and the same organ presents itself to us in manifold forms, has been called the metamorphosis of plants. Now, here again, at the beginning, we've got the same problem as in the previous one. These various organs, which are developed one after the other, correct, and as it were, one out of the other, wrong. But notice now a, a modification. He doesn't say one out of the other. He says, as it were, one out of the other. It already it begins with, the, uh, yeah, well, it's, a, it, it's a, as it were. So it's, the shift is towards the new idea in that, as it were, signaling that the old idea isn't quite right. As it were, one out of the other. And then he goes on at the end, bang. The process by which one and the same organ presents itself to us in manifold forms, the metamorphosis of plants, he's got it. One and the same organ in manifold forms. That's it. It's not one organ developing out of another one. Uh, 
notice also here uh, the way he says that this has long been recognized in a general way by naturalists and much attention has been given to the study of it. Notice also he says this has been called the metamorphosis of plants. He doesn't say I am going to call this the metamorphosis of plants. Now people who are very keen on Goethe and want to see him as a kind of founder of something extraordinary etc etc overlook all of this. They don't like to think of Goethe as a historical being who actually lived and moved and breathed in a certain context with a whole historical background behind him which he investigated. They like to think of him as sort of like, um, oh, you could count time from Goethe. It starts, you could a new, a, new, uh, a new time. Goethe's metamorphosis is planned 1790, that's year zero. So after that, time is AG, after Goethe. Mm-hmm. Everything, you know, sort of, it's the only thing that counts. Um, and he himself says, look, there's an awful lot of people been looking into this. And if you go into the history of botany, you'll find that it's true. Not only that, you find that almost everything that he suggests about the different metamorphoses has actually been made by someone else before. Uh, and in the, um, in the, the little paper back version I've got of the um, metamorphoses of plants, which I haven't brought with me, because I have brought this new thing, um, which is the, the translation I am using here is not the same as the translation I showed you yesterday. That translation is the Douglas Miller translation, which is in the collected works of Goethe. I'm using a translation from the Journal of Botany, 1860. Uh, this is the one that the anthroposophists have reproduced, the biodynamic gardening and all those people, in a, in, in a little booklet with Dennis Closex pictures in and so on and that. And in that one, um, the, they've, intru- they've included an introductory essay on, on this work by Steiner, which is very, very, very good. Uh, well worth reading uh, and um, <clears throat> that essay will also be in Goethe, Goethe the Scientist now renamed as uh, Nature's Open Secret and Steiner in this, in this thing actually mentions the English botanist who actually first talked about the, the metamorphosis not just because the leaves also metamorphose the leaves and Margaret will be doing a lot on this I presume the, le- the leaves metamorphose but there's an English botanist called Hill who actually first saw the petals and so on and that as and the floral organs as metamorphosis. And people talked about metamorphosis of leaves. Well, they're not met- the leaves don't metamorphose, um, but it's the same organ. And so he, the English botanist Hill had done. Now, Goethe knew about all of this. But what he did was he brought all this together, but he didn't just bring it together in an intellectual way. He lived this. He spent <coughs> a whole decade before this, this, this came out really working with plants and so on. He had his own garden. He looked after the market gardens. If you go to Weimar, you can go in and see Goethe's garden. When I went, it was just at the end of the GDR, so nothing was going there at all. <laughs> I'll tell you my Goethean experience in a minute about that. Um, but he also, they used to go out botanizing. Now, everybody loved botanizing, uh, especially women, especially young women, who had the opportunity to, to go out in the country with Goethe, um, the great man, and he used to go out with some sort of whole parties of young women botanizing. And that, this, was, this was the thing. In fact, not only that, because Rousseau, Rousseau wrote a brilliant book on the plant. Have you ever seen Rousseau's book on the plant? Very marvelous. And it's a book on the plant with some fantastic pictures in it, which was written to his niece. And so on and that. And Goethe thought this was a terrific book. And so he, he actually had in mind in writing his book various young ladies that he'd been botanizing with. Back to Eros. Brian, be very pleased. <laughs> uh, well, it's real, actually. And so um, everyone was involved, involved with this kind of thing. He did all this kind of, this kind of work um, all the time. So he wasn't just copying ideas from previous people. And he brought this together as a whole. And then, because what he did, as it were, was like a new beginning. It's a watershed work. And all that had gone before is now summed up and taken forward in Goethe. Therefore, there was no need to go back and refer to other people. Can you follow that? Do you know what a watershed is? Good. And uh, it, there are works like this in history, where, which they actually draw on a great deal of what's been done before but they bring it together and produce it in a new way 
so that after that there's no need to refer to what went before and therefore it looks like it started there and that's what this, this work is like uh, I don't want to spoil the flow but I must tell you about my experience in Goethe's house um, it's, it's profound um, uh, there was nothing in Goethe's house it was empty apart from a kind of cot upstairs which I said he slept in and um, he was a frugal man Strangely, he lived in a very frugal way in his house. And lots of huge plaster busts of Greek statues and Roman statues and so on and that. But there wasn't very much there. And of course, the GDR had just opened up. And so we, we had, you know, guards watching us all the time. And uh, there was this thing in the roof. And uh, Jackie said to me, that's a camera we're being spied on. And I said, no, I said, it's not a camera. It's, 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 uh, I could be, I don't know, fire alarm, spring flow, some kind. It's not a catch. She said, oh, it's a camera. They're photographing us. The stars here are on us. <laughs> so I said, well, I'll ask her. So I went to this, this woman who could have come up with one of those German films where you, know, you don't need me to describe her. Um, <laughs> and uh, I said to her, what is that? I said, no. I said, no. Then try to say it in joke. But I point of... Uh, what is that? And you better see, and she said, oh, I said, oh, come on. I said, that, what is it? She said, it is not permitted to say. <laughs> it's not permitted to say. I always said to her, it's a fire alarm, isn't it? Or a fire sprinkler, that's what it is. It's a fire alarm, isn't it? I cannot say. <laughs> so that was my, my experience in Goethe's house. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Uh, there we are. <coughs> well, the important thing to get here is this thing of the process by which one and the same organ presents itself to us in manifold forms. A finished organ does not somehow miraculously change into a different organ. It's the ability of the vegetative shoot to develop different forms. And you can perhaps begin to see here, first of all, that this is intrinsically dynamic. You have the metamorphosis is in the earlier embryonic stage of the coming into being of the organs, not in the finished organs. So Goethe's going back upstream into the coming into being of the organs ending with the, the finished organs that we see. You get the movement here, we're into this dynamic again. This is the dynamics of being here. Um, and I've got a picture. Now, I will show this picture. I will show this picture. <coughs> Car. I'll move this. Thanks. I'll do it, it's probably just. Need to switch on. That's switched on. It's always a mystery at Schumann like how these things work. It's good job I don't want PowerPoint, isn't it? It might be a switch in the wall. Yes, it's off. Yeah, it's on. No, no. It's a, it's a wonky it. switch. You did it. There's a wonky, wonky, wonky switch there. You better get the uh, right. health and safety in. Close the building down. <laughs> I'll just show this then again now. Now I've got it up. Red water lily. You can see it better now. I've actually, I mean, I've seen this with the white water lily, and I do remember when I saw this. And it was such a shock. Um, and. Uh, you could see it, or it was as if you were seeing it with your eyes in front of you. Remember, we talked about it. You seem to see it in the phenomenon. It's the idea of seeing it. I was seeing it, but I, it's there. Look, you can see it with your eyes. Um, but the one I want to show now is this. Oh, God. Sombre this morning. Oh, yes, here we are. 
Now, Brian told me what that was, what kind of thing that was, and I ne thought she never wrote it down. Meristan? Too late to ask it now. Meristan? Yes, yes, like it's Meristan. You, you can almost tell me what, what kind of plant it was. Can you? No, it's a Meristan, yes. This is, um, in fact, the vegetative tip. This is a very, very, you call it a very embryonic shoot, wouldn't you? Very, would you call it that? Yes. Very early stage of what's going to become the flower, mm -hmm. isn't it? Very early. Very early stage. This is the embryonic stage. And what you can see here is this. These will become sepals, the outer casing organs. One, two, three, four, five will become uh, one, two, three, four, five, yes, I think that's right, will become petals. And these will become stamens. So you've got here, uh, and in the book I've got this, and I've put others on, I call that becoming sepal, becoming petal, becoming stamen. This is the coming into being of these organs at a very, very early stage. And you can see there the one organ. And this one organ will um, manifest different forms. And the manifesting is already beginning, but it's not gone very far yet. And there you can see how it is, one organ manifesting different forms of itself. And that is the metamorphosis. Um, that's where it is, I should say. This, uh, this, uh, this, uh, picture is an electron micrograph, and it is not without its own intrinsic interest. Um, I, when I did a book tour of America, um, one of the places I went to talk at was the University of uh, oh God, North Carolina at Greensboro. And uh, this was a, a joint meeting had been organized by the biology department and the Department of Feminine Studies, or Feminist Studies because they saw Goethe plants, women would like it, so they got them to sort of co-sponsor it, you see, in that business. And so we, we did this, and the chap who organised it, a chap called Bruce Kirchhoff, and uh, when I met him there beforehand, we then had to walk down this long corridor to go to where the, the talk was going to be. He was talking about this, he was a biologist, a research biologist, and he was saying how much he wanted to get into Goethe and so on that. He, he sort of wanted me to, he wanted to let me know that I shouldn't look upon him as just an ordinary biologist. What he didn't know was that I had great respect for ordinary biologists. But he thought because I was there to talk about Goethe, I would be a Goethenist and I would look down on ordinary biologists. Nothing could be further from the truth. This is the kind of thing that happens. But he was going on and on about how could he get into Goethe, and, and I was very sympathetic in this thing, because I was starting to think about the question, what can I say to this man? What can I say to him about how he can get into Goethe? What's the way? And we're walking down the corridor, and he's talking with all these pictures over the walls, big pictures. We're walking down, and, and, look, and, I saw, and, I, and I saw this, and I said to him, what's that? And he told me what it was. And he, oh, first of all, oh, he said, you don't want to know about that. That's just, that's just ordinary biology, that's the kind of thing I'm trying to get away from. And I sort of thought, what is it? And he then sort of told me, rather than looked at me, and I said, well, that's Goethe. That is Goethe there. Well, he was horrified. Because he didn't want that to be Goethe. He didn't want what he'd been doing to actually also relate to Goethe. He wanted it to be something quite different. And so on and that. So, there we are. Anyway, I persuaded him to give me a thing of this before we left. He got me a photograph, which I've made this film. And he was very, very reluctant to, um, to, get, to give me it. And uh, partly it was because it turned out he was a man who had to play everything by the book. He was uh, done well in other circumstances. Uh, and he, um, he, he, he was very worried about this. He said that I would have to have permission from the head of the biology department to give you this, if not from the president of the university himself. And I said, oh, go on, go on, Bruce. Um, I won't tell anyone. <laughs> <laughs> and he did, and he gave it to him. He said, now, you promise you'll never, never tell anyone that I've done this. I'm not going to tell anyone. 
Um, anyway, I'm going to break my promise because I've actually put this in the book I'm writing. <laughs> <laughs> but this was 1996. I mean, how long does a promise last? I mean, <laughs> I mean, he's not very long. Is he? Is he still there? I've never had any contact with him since that day. Is he still there? Probably not. Is he still alive? I don't know. Um, you know. Um, and I, what I know with certainty is there is nobody, but nobody in that place gives us stuff about the exactly. using this picture, or they wouldn't even know where it came from. Exactly. I could have got it from anywhere. So I've broken my promise, but I think I've explained it doesn't actually matter, because it was, it was uh, in this case. Is it, is it ever the case that you... Can you ever say that? Is it, is it a case where it doesn't matter if you break your promise? Probably not. Mm. All right. <laughs> yeah, well, that's right, yes. Oh, dear. Yes, he had his problems. I think that's a very, very useful picture of the coming into being of the organs. Uh, and shows us where it is. Right. So. Oh, God, it's not coffee time, is it? Um, <laughs> we should have to do a bit more. Right. Um, so far, we've seen that in some sense, the different organs of the plant are all one organ in some way or other. But the question is, what kind of one is this? When we say... He says it's one and the same organ. But what kind of one is it that can present itself in manifold forms? What's the relationship between the one organ and the many forms in which it presents itself? There's something here which we could easily pass over, but we need to actually explore this in depth. And it will certainly turn out to be a key to, to very much, a great deal. Now, in his own day, and in fact, really ever since, an answer has been given to this question, what kind of one is this, which is based on an assumption that is nowhere to be found anywhere in Goethe's work. And this is the assumption that he was searching for what all the different organs have in common their lowest common denominator. People say, uh, what Goethe did was that he tried to, he looked at these different organs and he compared them and he tried to see what was the very same in all of them. And this would be the one organ. So he tried to abstract a unity from this multiplicity of different organs. And in doing that, of course, he would have to exclude all differences. You compare two organs, then another organ, and you remove all the ways in which they differ and just keep the ways in which they're the same. And if you refine it down, you'll get that with respect to which these organs don't differ at all, but are the very same. And they said, that's the one organ. He says, look, it's one and the same organ. That's it. Now, there are some... The movement of thinking here obviously has the effect of excluding difference from, from the unity. There are some statements I want to read. These are typical statements which I've just taken from one or two books and I've not even attributed these. I give references to everything. Since I'm going to say well, these are rubbish, I thought I'd say not refer to the authors. Um, one of them said that Goethe was, quote, transfixed by uniformities and commonalities in nature. Goethe was transfixed by uniformities and commonalities in nature. Now, in fact, that statement is uh, as far from Goethe as you can get. Um, then another one says, he sought for, quote, the general plan common to all organs by trying to find, quote, the simplest form of plant organ from which the anatomist's mind had stripped all the specializations 
required by the organs of real living plants. These are typical. Now Goethe talked to Schiller about showing the plant as working and alive, striving out of the hole into the parts. These statements seem to me to more portray nature as dead and finished, not as striving out of the hole, working as alive and so on and that. And in Goethe's writing, nothing like this is to be found anywhere. But everyone attributes this to, to what he was trying to do, find the common plan, remove all the differences. What have all these organs got in common? And so what's the ground plan? And so on. Um, in fact, we'll see in a bit that what that these, these actually do is they, they start with the finished organs and say, now let's abstract from them what they have in common. So the finished organs are already downstream. So these are going further downstream. This is the second stage downstream. Whereas Goethe is beginning to go back upstream into the coming into being of these organs from one organ. That one is entirely different from this. This kind of thinking, though, <laughs> is very, very common. And it may indeed have something to do with the remarkable success of the discovery of universal laws of nature in physics, a very mathematical physics, a very different idea of the unity of nature. And this is something which in Goethe's time everyone was obsessed with because of the huge success in physics from Galileo to Newton onwards. And there, for example, just to give you a particular example, uh, to show you what it's like, um, if you consider Kepler's third law. Let's consider planets moving around, the, the movement of planets. Uh, if you actually look at the movement of planets from an earthbound situation, all the different planets move in an entirely different way. They have characteristic patterns of movement in the sky in which they, they move, sometimes they go forward, sometimes they come back, they make loops and so on. That. That's from the Earth. If you, so all, all the planetary movements look completely different from the Earth to one another. If you then transpose to a, a heliocentric system where the Sun is in the centre, then all that complexity is reduced and they all become slightly elliptical. But they're all different. They've got different degrees of ellipticity. They've got different sizes, different distances from the Sun, different times to go round. So they're all different. Now, what Kepler discovered, and this is Kepler's third law, was although they're all completely different, if you take the radius, the distance from the sun to the planet, that's the radius of the orbit, and you cube it, you then divide that by the time it takes to go round once, the period, and you square it. So you have r cubed over t squared. Oh, I can't. We have r cubed over t squared. You can visualize that, can't you? It turns out that that's identically the same for all planets, which is astonishing, it's utterly astonishing. And when people discovered this kind of thing in the past, they thought it was a miracle. So much so because they were under the, that time very much under the influence of a revival of Neoplatonism they thought that this was something higher and therefore this must be what they attributed to thoughts in the mind of God. So when they discovered these universal laws, universal cause that in this case they're the same for all, all planets going around the sun, then they thought these are, this is how God thinks the universe. This is God's plan. Um, it's actually a miraculous thing to discover. Because there's no reason to suppose there would be anything the same. That's the important thing. They're all different. So why should there be anything the same? Why should there be something as simple as this the same? And it works out very accurately. One year here, we had a lot of trouble with one student. Got upset. Because I said that at that time, if we'd been alive at that time, we would have thought this was so amazing. This is what we'd be doing at Schumacher College on this course because actually that showed that the whole solar system was one whole and therefore was in a sense holistic. This deeply upset him because he was convinced that nothing that came from physics could possibly be holistic. Uh, nothing that came from... He was into chaos theory. And he thought holism, holistic, didn't come to a chaos theory. 
and so on. That. So he was very, very upset. Um, and um, he got worked up. And so Brian actually uh, got him in here. And Brian uh, went through on the board and he put all the figures in uh, for all the planets and did the RQ of T squared. And you will get a shock. But I, I, I gave him a set of figures um, <clears throat> because the, the, the units, because the figures are adjusted. So if you do it on your calculator, each time it comes out exactly the same. And if you do the figures in certain units, it comes out to be 1.0000 for every one. And he was quite stunned, uh, apparently. Um, saved him from the nervous breakdown because and he, he then couldn't get over it because he then saw <coughs> why it was that I said, this is a miracle. And if this had been, if we'd been around then, this is what we'd be, would be saying to people, this is the new thing, this is it, we've discovered God's thinking, <laughs> and so on and that. And, <coughs> of course, all that's gone. <coughs> and what, what happens now with this kind of thing is we don't experience the, the sheer magic of it. What we experience is the deadness of it. We say, oh, it just makes everything the same. It's uni uniformity, isn't it? Because that's, that's us. Because the vision's gone and we're left with the leftovers. And everything becomes uniform. And the important thing about this, of course, is that all difference is excluded. Mars is not allowed in any way whatsoever to be any different from Neptune. Well, from, uh, sorry, from, from Jupiter. Because Neptune hadn't been discovered. Be careful, is it? Uh, Mars is not allowed to be in any way any different from Venus and so on and that. All are identically the same. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a miraculous discovery. And I can see why it would lead people under the influence of Neoplatonism to think they'd discovered something very, very, very deep indeed. And therefore this must be the thoughts of God. Which Kepler certainly thought that. But this book's writing is full of this stuff. Um, <clears throat> which is why people, when I was a kid, who used to go on about... Uh, science being against religion hadn't got a clue. If you go back to the early thing, it's entirely different. But I think this kind of thing affected people. And of course, with Newton's gravity, that was the biggest thing of all. That was the mega blockbuster. Because here he discovered this simple equation which holds for all possible bodies in the whole universe. In fact, you can define the universe as that for which Newton's laws hold. Newton's gravity. And it, the great thing about these laws of nature is, these mathematical laws, they have, they're not affected by the nature of the materials or anything. Gravity works the same for everything, regardless of what it is. So, all, you know, it's, it's amazing. It's the same with the Kepler law, actually. It doesn't matter what the planet's made of. It can be made of gas, it can be made of ice, or made of rock, it makes no difference. It's still the same. I mean, it, it's just so unexpected. But you end up with the idea, when you start at the end of this, with this is what they all have in common. And what everything in the universe has in common, therefore, is the universal law of gravity and so on. So this kind of thinking, uh, therefore, that people then applied to the plant and Goethe, oh, he's trying to find what's common between these organs by getting rid of the differences. It was almost natural for people to think in that way at that time. And also, as we'll see later, I'll mention later, I'm not going to mention it now, um, because, again, they had the thought that if we could do this, then, again, we'd get the common plan. We would actually then be able to say, well, perhaps that's the plan according to which God himself created things. Oh, we're back to the thoughts of God again. And biology, which was only ju just at this time called biology, as physics was only just called physics, but the, 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 the study of living organisms had not had this great success that had recently been had in mathematical physics, as it became known as. It was originally known as, not what we can now call mathematical physics, mathematical experimental physics was originally called physio-mathematics. And then it was mathematical physics. Now that had this great success. So the people doing the biological stuff would love to have a similar success. So if we can actually find the plan according to which God has made the organisms, wow, we're up there with those physicist guys, you know, and so biology is launched and so on. It's a transcendental science like physics 
and so on and that. So there was an, a motivation also to think in that way and so on. And all of this, therefore, was attributed to Goethe. And the fact is that around Goethe, there were an awful lot of people thinking in just this way. So that's another complication. But he didn't think in this way at all. And he had this thing, there's something about Goethe that's really different. It really is something that I, 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 I'm almost beginning to convince myself we could start counting time from, 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 from Goethe. So, you know, I'm almost beginning to think that as I'm talking here. Because he thought in such, such a completely dynamical way. Everything he did in his poetry and everything, it's as if the man himself just had this kind of metamorphic mind. And so that's, that's what's really quite remarkable about him. Enough of that. Uh, so, when we read Goethe carefully, paying attention to the movement of thinking, we can see for ourselves that he was doing something radically different from just looking for what all the plant organs have in common. We've already seen this statement, quote, nature creates the most varied forms by the modification of one single organ and metamorphosis, the process by which one and the same organ presents itself to us in manifold forms. Elsewhere in letters and the diary of his Italian journey, he says this, some quotes here, he is, writes to someone, and he says, he is becoming aware of the form with which again and again nature plays and in playing brings forth manifold life. So it's very, very dynamic. Nature's playing with the form, producing all these different forms and so on and that. And then, the thought becomes more and more living that it may be possible out of one form to develop all plant forms. Notice he doesn't say the form with which nature plays again and again is nature's model or ground plan of the plant, just as he does not say he's trying to reduce all plant organs to one form. Now on another occasion he says something which is a real clue. He says in a letter or something, it had occurred to me that in the organ of the plant which we ordinarily designate as leaf. The true Proteus is hidden, who can conceal and reveal himself in all forms. Now that's a very interesting statement. Uh, the, the, in the organ, we ordinarily designate as leaf. The true Proteus is hidden, who can conceal and reveal himself in all forms. It's the, very difficult to look upon that as saying he was looking for what all the different organs have in common. It's much more alive. He's talking about the creation of difference within unity, not arriving at unity by the exclusion of difference. His thinking is the other way around. It's the creation of difference within unity, not reaching unity by the exclusion of difference. It turns it round. Of course, there is, it reminds me, uh, there is a, a lot of reasons, because in talking about this kind of thing, Goethe didn't always say things that helped because of the reason that we've said. You can't... Um, you can't get it clearly. And at one point, he says, Hypothesis. All is leaf. Well, that, think of a hypothesis as a constructive conception, not a dogmatic enunciation. But people have taken that as a dogmatic enunciation. Goethe said all the organs in the plant were leaves. Mm -hmm. No, he didn't say that. But he, and here, I uh, remind you that, because he says, in, in the organ, we ordinarily call leaf. And a lot of people say things like, Goethe said that all the organs of the plant are metamorphoses of the leaf. As if somehow the, the leaf form changed into all the other forms and so on. But what he's actually saying is, that which forms the leaf 
it also forms the petal and the stamen and therefore it is there in the leaf and we could therefore take the leaf as representative of this but I want to focus on Proteus because I think that really helps us enormously it's much easier to do now you all know that Proteus is the Greek god who can hide and reveal himself in any form he chooses well now everybody is very familiar with this because he's not only a Greek god this figure can, appears in mythologies all around the world doesn't it and if there's someone here who's indigenous American they'd tell me exactly what it was in their lot and so on and that and everyone, everyone's familiar with this in all mythologies there's some, some being somewhere that can take on different forms and yet it's always the same being is that right? Does, do, do, I'm being multicultural here it's my attempt to be multicultural <laughs> and not, uh, and not uh, what's the word? Um, I don't know what the word is. But I'll go back to Proteus because I can follow that. He can present himself in manifold forms, ever differently, and yet it's always Proteus. Now you wouldn't try to understand Proteus by collecting together all the different manifestations and trying to see what they all had in common. <laughs> Such a procedure would be far too late. What is essential about Proteus is the coming into being, the appearing, not the specific form in which he appears on any occasion. The attempt to find a common identity based on the different appearances could only result in an average Proteus. Now, is there any more useless idea than that of an average Proteus. Doesn't it rather negate the very whole idea of Proteus, this being that could appear dynamically in all these different forms? Ah, oh, I've got it now. I understand Proteus. There's an average Proteus. It's absurd. Um, and this, of course, is the absurdity into which people are led when they think that Goethe is trying to find what all the organs of the plant have in common as if he's looking for an average organ. In fact, you can, of course, do this. You can produce an average organ. You can do this. You can abstract from them. And this was something that occupied the British biologists very, very much in the first half of the 19th century up to the time of Darwin. It was all called archetypal anatomy. We'll come to that later. And this is what, but this is what they, this is what they did. Well, don't worry about the name because um, I shouldn't use that word. I, I, let, me, let me retrieve that arrow sped from the bow. And bring it back. <laughs> God, dear me, yeah. In fact, such a, you can do that, but it, actually such an average organ is clearly, which excludes all differences, is clearly a cul-de-sac. It's a dead end. And what people thought they could do, for example, was once they got the average organ, they could see from that how all the other organs were formed. Well, of course you can't. Because what you've done is you've taken the different organs, you've excluded all their differences, found what's the very same in them. So how can, from that can you possibly work out how they became different? Because you actually did it by getting rid of the differences. So it's a dead end. And you will find a unity here, a unity in the multiplicity. It is a unity, but it's the unity of the dead end. It's not the unity of the living source. And that's what Goethe is trying to do, is to reach the unity of the living source. <coughs> now, that, I think, will help to see uh, when we talk in terms of uh, this thing of Proteus. Um, so what, what we can say here yep, is this. <coughs> I, I thought I had an overhead with this, but I don't. And it got muddled up again. Uh, I thought I had an overhead for the next bit, and I don't have one. All right. It doesn't make, it make any difference. Uh, I can do it this way. Let's have some organs. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I don't know. Let's have a leaf. 
let's have a petal. Let's have a stamen, shall we? That'll do. Go and go and get to it. Now, what what people usually do is they say, "There, the, oh, this is what you start with." Because this is always what you start with, because you start with an actual plant. And so you're starting with what, in the cross section you're looking at here, our finished organs. Still, the plant is growing and changing, so it's not going to stay like that for long. But the moment you study it, you're starting with organs that are already formed. So we think of those as finished organs. And then what you can do is you can try to abstract from them, like that, what they have in common. What do I put? And I call this the unity of finished organs. The unity of the finished organs. Um, what they have in common. You can try and find that. Oh, what's the total? Right. Now, people think that's what Goethe does, but he doesn't. If you imagine those organs, you could you could lay those organs organs out on a plane. Normally, when people do this, they put them all on a big sheet of paper. I want you to imagine putting them not on a sheet of paper, but on a sheet of glass. Um, so you can see through the glass on both sides. So, let's suppose, you, here's the sheet of glass, it's here. This is where I do damage to myself. When I was younger, I used to, at this point, do something very acrobatic. I think it would be a very good idea if I don't try it. Uh, yes, I'm not going to try it. Uh, they have a sheet. Imagine the sheet of glass is here. So these organs have been put on this sheet of glass. And then the Goethe's here. And they say, oh, I see. Goethe's actually got them there. And he's looking at them and seeing what they have in common by removing all the differences. But he's not doing that. There's a sheet of glass. Goethe's on the other side of the sheet of glass. I used at one point, you see, to do a, a twist in midair. But I can't do that now. Uh, and he, the, he's on this side of the glass. And he's coming down through the coming into being into the finished organs where the other one is <laughs> uh, So he's coming down here like that. Yes. And everyone assumes he's coming down there like that. So what you've got up there is the dynamic unity of coming into being. Oh. Hi, ladies. And that's that. Uh, here, this is just this, this is the phenomenon here. We call this the phenomenon. And that's finished organs. I'll call them finished organs. I'll, hyper I'll put them in quotes. Finished organs. So you can see the whole dynamic now. This, this is upstream. And that's what Goethe does, look. He tries to go upstream. If I, put, if I do this in black, you'll see this in black. I should have put upstream in black. Never mind. I'll do that. I'll put upstream in black. Because this is now, this is a methodological <coughs> Upstream there. This is downstream. This is downstream. So this is downstream. And this is even further downstream. So 
um, that's the uh, that's the picture we come to at this particular point. There's an awful lot more to come out, but that's where we've got to, which is a brilliant point to have reached. I've, once again, I've just timed it wonderfully. Uh, you always begin with the phenomenon which is already downstream. The difference is you go back upstream in search for unity, or you go, don't go further downstream in search of unity. Go upstream, you find the dynamic unity of the emerging organs. <coughs> so you now come into the phenomenon from the unity. You come into the, the, the multiplicity from the unity. And so you can begin to think in a protein way that creates the most varied forms by the modification of one single organ. If you don't do that, then you go the other way and you try to find the universe, the unity, by starting with the phenomenon going further downstream, you come to the unity of the finished organs. <clears throat> That's the sort of average organ. And now, finally, what you do, and this is the real thing, having reached that, because everybody knows, everybody knows that unity is higher. Unity is always something higher. This is the influence of Platonism and so on on us in our culture. Unity is always higher. Uh, if you could just get the sense of the infiltration of this form of Platonism, which is actually not Plato at all, it's pseudo-Platonism or vulgar Platonism. I'll talk about that later. But the unity is always something higher, and the multiplicity, oh dear me, that's something lower. So when you find a unity, you know, as sure as eggs are eggs, it must be higher. And so if you found your unity down here, which is an abstraction, then that you think must be higher. That must be the unity. So where do you imagine that unity is? Not down at the bottom, but up at the top. You back project this cheese. Trying to get to the note by where the cheese is. Up here. This is the boomiest thing of trying to get to the milk by way of the cheese. Right? This is cheese. And you say, that's the unity. That must have been there at the beginning. And you back project into the beginning this useless dead end unity from which nothing can come. And this is actually the error, error once you get it, not just here in biology, but so much of metaphysics is actually based on just this error. So this is pretty terrific stuff. And it's time for coffee.